I am quite emotional today because this is a 200 talk. Uh, so many familiar names I can see in the audience today. And I just uh, want to recollect a few moments. We inaugurated the Khaki Lab on 13 December 2019. And uh, without realizing that it's a Friday, Friday the 13th. And so fan pandemic hit us and we thought uh, we will close down all the activities. Uh, there's no future, but the sheer grit and determination shown by Team Khaki ensured that we shifted quickly online. And it became so popular during the pandemic that we had two talks and one virtual walk every week. And the response was tremendous. Uh, many of you will remember. Once the lockdown eased out, we made the talks free and reduced the frequency to once a week. But we have continued. The sheer diversity of the topics uh, that we have covered in our last 199 talks is mind-boggling. From art and architecture to battles and bullion to commerce and communities, we have covered the A, B, C of heritage of Mumbai and beyond. But miles to go before we sleep. As this is possible, all this is possible due to the perseverance of three individuals. First, whom we lovingly call Lord of Kolaba, Mr. Farooq Jijina, who single-handedly ensured that everything went smoothly for the first one or two years. Then Sukhanandan Vora, who was introducing just now, whom we lovingly call Sukhi, uh, took over from him and ensured that the quality of the events was not compromised. But one person who toiled silently to ensure the success of all these talks is Amrita, who is right next to Shantaji. Uh, she joined as an intern, but quickly became an employee and then the backbone of many khaki initiatives. Other team members have contributed for making these talks successful and would like to thank the entire team khaki. Soon physical activities in khaki lab will be revived and hope to see you there soon. Hope to have your wholehearted support for the same. Though she needs no introduction, I'll request uh, Shantaji, uh, I want to thank her that she has graciously accepted the invitation to deliver the 200 online talk of Khaki. Thanks a lot, Shantaji. Well, good evening. Namaskar. First, I want to begin with uh, two apologies and one warning. The apology is for changing the title of my talk. When I was asked to decide on the title, I was deep into a book that I was translating and I had a deadline to catch. Although I knew what I was going to talk about, I didn't have the mind space just then to quickly think of a title. Now I want to clarify it that when I said urban living, I meant modern living. Because urban living is a much more general thing. Modern living is specific to what I'm going to talk about. Now the warning. I'll be speaking continuously without the aid of images. I know that one image is equal to 1,000 words, etc. But I do not take pictures and I do not collect pictures. On that score, I'm handicapped, but I try and do my best to create pictures for you with such descriptive skills as I do possess. I now want you to consider the following passage. It comes from a nostalgic essay about Dadat, written in the 1950s by the late professor M. V. Raja, Yaksha of Elphinstone College. He refers to Gokhle Rodi. In the passage, it was laid out during 
the late 20s, 1920s, I mean, and the early 1930s. Along with Cadell Road on the other side of Shivaji Park, later renamed Veer Savarkar Park, this road has been a major link between South and North Bombay. Once it was a grand road. Now it is divided into two parts. There is a narrow lane for traffic, which then moves at snail's pace, head to tail. The rest of the uh, broad swathe of the road has been boarded up for the last five years for ongoing work on the Mumbai Metro Line 3. We have been asked to forgive the inconvenience caused by the work because it is for the city's glowing future. While that future takes its time coming, let us leap backwards to the early 20th century and we will let Professor Raja Deksha show us how the same road, Gokhle Road, came into being. This is how the quotation runs. Take the expansive Gokhle Road, for instance, now flanked by elegant buildings, 35 years ago, it did not exist, not even as a muddy track. It bulldozed its way into existence through trees, lush vegetables, and huts. And a splendid, much talked about Shivaji Park, that expansive Maidan, which led no, to cricket matches. For cultural festivals and political rallies attended by lakhs and surrounded by those neat habitations. And two rows on land where once farm groves, vegetable patches and huts. Uh, that was Dadar, but still not named Dadar as it was during the time of the East India Company. There is another passage that I'm going to read out now. It is from the Indian Express, dated October 29, 2023, and that is as recently as last Saturday, or was it Sunday? The headline reads, Dadar, the new f and B hub of Mumbai, question mark. It tells you which way the wind is blowing in this century-old neighborhood. About this sudden interest in Dadar, a retail and hospitality consultant has been quoted in the article as saying, Dadar is like vodka. It is neutral enough to be mixed with anything. If you ask anyone who has spent a decade or so in Mumbai about who lives in this neighborhood, their expanse would be middle class, South Bombay and Worli. A Porsche. Bandra is hip and trendy. Pockets beyond Kandigi are down market, but Dadar holds a neutral perception, whatever that might be. Between the toddy that the Bandaris distilled in Dadar once upon a time, and the fancy liquor that will soon flow 
once our class conscious researchers set up business in the other's neutral space. The middle class will continue to drink tea in the home and beer outside. How this middle class came to make the other its home is one part of this story. What they did with the new opportunities that this new neighborhood offered to build a strong center for education and culture is another part of the story. How their new life was a final break from the traditional roots that they had come from to a modern form of living will make the third part of the story. And the fourth and final part will be about heritage, about how far the history and culture of the place will be preserved for the future. But before we come to that, let us look back briefly at the past to find our bearings. We all know <clears throat> sorry, that until the middle of the 19th century, Mumbai did not exist. It was created by reclaiming land from the sea and merging the existing seven islands into a landmass that became the city. Of the seven islands, one was Mahikavati. Mahikavati had a long history of occupation by various dynasties from Gujarat and elsewhere. This history has been recorded in a fascinating chronicle called Mahikavati Chi Bakhar. The editor of the Bakhar, historian P.K. Rajvade, ends his introduction to the book with a list of the dynasties that ruled over the island from 1060 to 1460. Neither Western nor Indian historians appear to have had any knowledge of the earlier period during which Hindu kings ruled here. Western history only begins with the Muslim rule that started in 1351 and ended with the coming of the Portuguese in 1448. Had Mahikavati Ji Bakhar not been discovered, edited, and published by Rajvade, we would have continued to be ignorant of that early history. That would have meant that we would have been ignorant of that uh, of why the Bandaris, Surya Mounshis, and Sumavamshis came to be the first settlers of the island. The descendants of these communities established themselves as landowners around the space. They owned the bodies which carried their family names. So even today we have Churiwadi, Dhuruwadi, Patilwadi, etc. The East Indian Christian community settled around was what was to be Gokhale Road. They too owned wadis, which also carried family, family names like Gomes Wadi, Fernandes Wadi, Da Silva Wadi. The nucleus of this East Indian community in Dada was the church of Nosa Senora, the Salvachau. It was built in 1596 and is known today, of course, as Portuguese church. 
the fourth altar of the church, designed by the world-famous architect Charles Correa in 1975, stands in exactly the same spot as the first, which is today the junction of Roxledo South and SK Bole Mark. But the part of the other around the church came to be known as Salva Song. The name was obviously a corruption of Salva Chao by the native Christians whose language was Marathi. Under the British, the area continued to be called Salva Song, while Mahikavati became Mahim and the rest of what is Dada today was called Lower Mahim. A large expanse of wooded land located here was called Mahim Woods. This was to become Shivaji Par some 250 years later. In short, there was nothing yet that was called Dadar. So, where did that name drop from? Place names don't fall from the sky. They're not figments of somebody's imagination. They generally describe local occupations as Dubita does, or refer to a local legend as Varteshwar does. The name Dadar comes with no such explanation. It got its name only when the two railway lines were laid. The first laid in 1856 was a great Indian Peninsula Railway, which in my childhood used to be called GIP, and now it is Central Railway. The second line was inaugurated a few years later and was called the Bombay, Baroda, and Central India Railway, which to us back then was BBCI and is now known as Western Rail. Among the many stations that were built along these lines, one straddled both the railways and was built to serve the Salva Song Lower Mahim area. And that was called Dalar. How did that happen? There are two theories, both of which sound plausible to me. One comes from the tales that old residents told their children and grandchildren. They said before the land was properly filled, they used to use ladders to cross from one body to the next over the low-lying areas in between. If we imagine several such ladders dotting the landscape, it was possible for a man going to lower Mahim for some work to tell his wife, I'm going to Dadar. Because Dadar in the language meant staircase, like a ladder or a bridge. The second theory is perhaps even more believable. The East India Company men were in Bombay for trade. Dadar, a place of swarms, coconut groves, paddy fields, vegetable patches, meant nothing to them. It offered no prospects for trade. However, it was on the way to places beyond, which did. Gujarat, for instance, grew cotton. 
it was for trade that the railways were built in the first place. When stations had to be named, the railway men simply picked up what was available. When the station in Lohan had to be named, they looked around for something that was already established in the local town. They heard that old residents used to call the spot near the station Dadar because there used to be a wooden bridge there which spanned the low-lying areas between Mahim and Parel. The bridge had vanished, but the name remained in local memory. And that was good enough for the railway men. They called the station Nada. Either way, it came from the route which meant ladder or bridge. As always happens, the name was then passed on to the two areas which flanked the railway lines. One became Dada East and the other became Dada West. The railways enabled Dadar to take its first step into modern living. This happened in many ways that I will not go into here. What I will do in order to illustrate my point is to relate a small local story. Just off the Prabhadevi end of there stands a gracious 250-year-old bungalow called Dhuru Lodge. The sixth generation of Dhurus lives there today. Kashinath Dhuru of the third generation had to walk for his education to four different schools because there were no schools then in Lower Mahim. He began with a primary school in Parel and ended by walking to a high school in Kalbadevi, from where he matriculated. Now, Kashidan Duru was a progressive man who believed in the modern idea of education for women. Time passed, he grew older, his son got married. And then he realized that his young daughter-in-law had no education at all. This disturbed him. He was determined to set the situation right. But, if this was happening in his time, no woman, leave alone a young girl, could have done or been allowed to do what he had done for his education, that is, walk all over the city. Luckily, that wasn't required any longer. Although there was no school for girls in Dada, the BBCI was there. She could travel safely by train to her school in Chaniluk. And so the family carriage would drop her off at Dada station in the morning and pick her up from there in the afternoon. I must record here that the BBCI also served my mother and her two sisters to travel to marine lines where they got their BA degrees from the SNDT University. If, like women's education, cosmopolitanism is seen as another marker of a modernizing society. 
then the other West, which I'm best, serves as a great example. When the long distance trains were inaugurated, Dada, which was close to Mumbai's mill area and itself had two or three mills, attracted migrants from the hinterland who were looking for employment. The area around the station, once sparsely populated and uh, full of paddy fields, vegetable patches and thatched cottages and coconut trees began to fill up with laborers and clerks from upcountry. Wadi owners in those areas saw in these migrants an opportunity to turn their land to profitable use by building shawls. These were the first Pakka masonry buildings to come up in Dada. Charles afforded a lifestyle that was quite close, in a sense, to the rural lifestyle from which the migrants had come. It was not a brutal break from that line. Although each residential unit in a chawl was small, in fact, cramped, there was a common veranda where neighbors could interact and interfere with each other's lives. And there were common toilets on each floor. In an unforgettable article written for the India Today magazine, the late Shiv Sena leader, Pramod Navalkar, has said, the chawl culture unique to Mumbai practices the most important religion, the religion of loving and caring for your neighbors. Every festival and occasion, good or bad, is celebrated together. And the common corridor toilets, much hated by young people these days, have been the venue of many a love story. These romances often progress to what we call tumbrel managers. A tumbrel was, of course, the tin or enamel mug which chawl dwellers carried to the common toilet in the corridor. P.L. Deshpande recounts a hilarious tale in his stories about a Bombay chawl, in which a tumbrel goes missing. Accusations fly fast and furious among the chawl dwellers, causing a temporary rift in the love thy neighbor religion of chores. It is no wonder that people who are used to collective living in chores in Girgaon and other areas in South Bombay were loath to relocate to the self-contained modern flats that were coming up in Mumbai's first planned neighborhood, Shivaji Park, located in Dada. Shivaji Park and Matunga Sayan in Dada East were planned to lessen the congestion in South Bombay after the plague had broken out there in 1896. It raged for 11 years. Although the plague was the trigger, it took 20 years for the hot debates that followed to be settled, for landowners to be pacified, and for the division of turfs between the Bombay City Improvement Trust and the Municipal Corporation before the Shivaji Park Mahim scheme for the development of Mahim Woods finally took off.
the long and the short of it is that by 1937, all the housing plots around Shivaji Park were sold for the construction of residential blocks of flats, which contained their own toilets. Private spaces, closed front doors, independent toilets with flushes were something of a culture shock to the new residents. Together, they compelled people to take a huge step into modern living. But amongst these, what remained as a sticking point still to be sorted out was the location of toilets inside the home. Going for your ablutions in fields was how villagers had done it. The first chawls in the city had basket privies located outside the chawls from where manual scavengers lifted excreta. This system presented no problems to caste Hindus since the scavenger came from caste whose members were supposed to be born to do such work. Later, when flushes were installed in stalls, the toilets themselves were still located outside the home at the end of common corridors. But to have a toilet inside the house, <coughs> sorry, meant making a huge religious social shift in belief. Residents were happy to live in houses built with the latest technology of RCC. Modern technology has never been an issue with religious orthodoxy. But how could a sweeper be allowed to enter the house to clean one's toilet? Architects were quick to find a solution to the problem. Separate entrances were created for sweepers to enter, clean the toilets, and leave without homeowners even needing to set eyes on them. The third aspect of modernity in the other was that it was cosmopolitan. Homes in Dadar came to be occupied by people from practically every unit, every community you could name. The Portuguese church site already had a large settlement of East Indian Christians. In the old days, we saw women in typical East Indian Lugadars visiting our East Indian neighbors downstairs. Across the road from us was Bandarwara, where Bandaris climbed coconut trees and tapped toddy. Behind our house lived Malbaris, Gujaratis, Punjabis. Nearer to Shivaji Park, there were Jewish families. On both sides of the park, lived Punjabis who were associated with the film industry. And there was even one Irani family which owned land of Kadelzo. This again was a departure from village life and chore life. Villages had caste neighborhoods. Migrants carried the habit of caste segregation into the chores of the city. But Dadar was open to all comers. And yet, every street was a community unto itself. Everybody knew everybody else. That and other factors, which I shall soon talk about, gave the place its character, its unique character, its sense of self, its value system, its culture. 
to F and D detailers of today. Dada is attractive because of its alleged neutrality. But ask anybody who has lived here during the five decades between the 40s and the 90s when the building boom started. And they will say Shivaji Park means culture. Let me take Amar Hind Mandar as an example of what young, forward-looking, progressive residents of the others were doing to give this place its culture. A few young people who had come together to form a citizen's group and started off by organizing kabaddi matches to bring the community together. They happened to meet Prakash Bhai Moharikar, one of the quietest, most sincere followers of the socialist, of the socialist leader, Sanik Guruji. He lived in Shivaji Park and headed the Sanik Guruji Vidyalaya. Under his leadership, this group of young people decided to organize talks and debates that would wake up the community to current social and political issues. The idea resulted in the inauguration of Amar Hind Mandar on 26 January 1947. The most important project that they launched was a week-long series of lectures every year known as Vasanta Vyakhyan Mala. In the first year, these lectures were held in the Antonio de Silva High School in Compa. In 49, the Mandal acquired its own premises in Amarwadi, Gokhledo North. Vasantya Khyanmata has been held regularly since then, till today, and it is still going strong. The second example of a cultural initiative is the Dadar Sarva Jalik Vachanale, located in Chabila Lane of Ranadevo, which runs from Shivaji Park to Dadar Stage. This is a story of total commitment to the cause of books and reading. Like Amarhidna Mandar, this institution is not only still alive, but thriving. It started as a heap of personally owned books in a tin trunk. When the books began to overflow the trunk and the business of the library began to overflow the small room in which it functioned, the library shifted to the home of the founder of Chabilda School. When the library outgrew that too, Kashinath Dhu, the same personage who sent his daughter-in-law to school by train, helped the library founders to get a place in a new building that had come up in Chabildas Lane. Finally, the library bought a plot in that same lane in 1926 and built itself its own place. That is where it still stands, catering to eager readers who cannot always buy books or even accommodate them in the cramped spaces in which they live. Along with these cultural initiatives, there is another that came up through a combination 
of commerce and religion. At the southern end of NCK Road, after it crosses Rana Depo, stands the Jain Mandir, built in 1905. Located opposite to it is Kirtikar Market, where you can get anything and everything you need for the kitchen. Back then, when bullock carts used to be used for transporting things, they used to transport grain for Kirtikar Market. And they would park between the mandir and the market and offload their goods. Grain spilled from the sacks and attracted pigeons by the hundreds. Pigeons busy pecking would often get crushed under the wheels of oncoming vehicles. The muni at the temple could not bear this tragic loss of life. In sympathy with him, a nearby shopkeeper managed to persuade the municipal corporation to allow the center of the square to be turned into a kabutar khana. Permission was granted. A circle was fenced off for the birds and Roosts and bird baths were installed for them. Devotees visiting the mandir began to feed grains to the pigeons. There was no longer any need for the birds to scrounge around for grain. The Kabutar Khan ended the daily bird massacre. There is a part of Dalar culture, which is marked by a certain place and a certain habit, but no monument. However, one can say without hesitation that it could not have happened anywhere else except in that particular spot in Dalar. Located on N.C. Kelkar Road, on the other side of Ranade Road from Jain Mandir, there is a small verdant park called Veer Kotwal Udyan. It serves as a traffic island as well as a shady spot for people to relax in. Meeting N.C. Kelkar Road at that spot is Tirag Bridge, the vital link between Dadar East and Dadar West. The garden once occupied a much larger area and was called Kale Maidan, Black Park. During Mumbai's play years, the municipality passed a law which made it compulsory for water bodies in the area to be filled up. The Udyan stands today where Hansali tank used to be. The tank was filled up with coke from a nearby textile mill. That turned the park black. But from the time the tank existed, Farmers from Salset and Bashir found it convenient to take the trade to Dadar, carry their produce to the tank, wash and clean up there, and get down to selling the produce. The practice continued even when the tank was filled, and it continues today, even when Kali Maidan has become. Veer Kotwal Udyan and farmers have been replaced by wholesale merchants. The time and manner of work too has not changed. 
business still starts at five in the morning. There is hectic buying and selling for the next four hours. Then by nine o'clock, everything is over. If you cross the bridge after that, you will see no sign of either wholesalers or buyers or retailers. You might just see a leaf or two fluttering along the pavement. The history and culture of a place is an intangible thing. It is what gives a place its character. History and culture are made by people. But when people change, the character of a place changes. It gives way to another character created by the new people who move in and live in a new way, in a new form of accommodation. This is happening to the other very rapidly today. Gokhale Road was once non-existent. It was laid out in the late 1920s and early 30s. It dominated the landscape and the activities and imagination of local people. Now, sooner or later, a metro line will run underneath. A station will stand above the ground. In the passage which I read out at the beginning, Professor Raja Jaksha writes about the elegant building that lined the road. Nearly all of them date from 1934. Today, three of them have reported cracks on account of the metro work. Several of them have been demolished. Towers are rapidly replacing the old two- and three-story buildings. Obviously, with this change, the other lifestyles too will change, culture will change, character will change, but history will continue to be made. Koinut Square, that stands at the other end of Gokhevo, from the Portuguese church is the icon of tomorrow. More than anything else, it is this tower certified by relevant authorities as the tallest commercial building in India. This has drawn the attention of F and B retailers to the other. It already houses several smart retail outlets. One of them is West, oh, sorry, West Side, which stands exactly on the spot where Kohinoor Mills once stood. When the mill closed its gates here, but was operational elsewhere, it used this plot for its detail shop. The shop attracted hordes of middle-class housewives looking for matching blouse pieces among the million shades of two by two. No. But the had no. No. In the women in towers do not wear saris. They do not need blouse pieces anymore. Perhaps West Side is what gives them what they want to wear. Koino cinema was once at the heart of Dada culture. This is where we saw Kamhat films like Kunku and Ramishastri Toshi. In his novel Kalandar, Srina Pense has described the violence that was involved in building Koino cinema. I will quote from the novel. One day, the factory was raised. 
the buildings and dilapidated chores in the vicinity were demolished. The well was filled up. A pond that had nudged its way in between the buildings was filled. The other English school shifted house to the Popatlal Chal nearby. And the Koenu cinema rose where all these places had been. Suddenly, the area was bright with lights. One light was ending and another pulsating into being. That is precisely what is happening to the other now. One life is ending and another pulsating into being. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That was simply mesmerizing. And all I can say is that um, what you said right in the beginning was absolutely right. Uh, I'm a great believer in pictures and photographs. But when someone can paint uh, such a beautiful, delicious, then uh, pictures are no longer needed. You were so right in that. Thank you very much again for that. Uh, of course, the chat box is filled with uh, so many compliments for uh, your talk. They're filled with compliments also of people whom uh, you've evoked this brilliant nostalgia on this Saturday afternoon. Those who've uh, lived in Dadar uh, maybe for decades or decades before are now thinking of uh, uh, how life was and how life has been and what happens there. So thank you so much for that. Uh, it, it, it feels uh, beautiful and delightful and, um, you know, just right for our 200th uh, talk. Uh, before I come to some of the compliments, I'd also like to thank all those people who've given us a very generous congratulations for our 200th talk in the uh, chat. Thank you very much. And please stay with us on this journey. Uh, <clears throat> I think that uh, uh, someone, Kanan, has, for instance, mentioned that uh, he's born in Mangal Nivas Shivaji Park, and, and he's now told that the name of the building has changed. Uh, Adil, our regular, says that he's been staying at Dadar West since 19, 1982, and I can tell you that uh, I can uh, detect a sense of great pride as he says that. Um, Sarika says that uh, she's a Dadarkar at heart and private, proudly living there for 43 years. Um, Girish Nayak says that he loves your observation that Charles afforded the residents the ability to interact and interfere. Uh, that was uh, what uh, vivid imagery from uh, uh, movies as well from that. Uh, and of course, Jyoti um, and Girish also uh, enjoyed, uh, like everyone else, the Tumbril, uh, idea of Tumbril uh, romances, a word that I heard for the first time, but I can fully uh, understand that. Uh, others have said, uh, again, uh, you know, sort of talked about their nostalgia. Uh, Firoza Ji said, uh, Dear Shanta, you painted such a brilliant lecture on Dadar with a paintbrush of words. Thank you for sharing with us this gift that you're so abundantly blessed with. Uh, just absolutely uh, uh, worded. For all those who asked us for a recording of uh, this and any other talks, we have a YouTube channel, uh, Khaki Lab. Please subscribe to the channel and you'll get this talk within a week and all our other past uh, talks as well. Uh, Nishit has said that uh, Shantaji, you're uh, an encyclopedia, especially about this subject. Uh, Prasad Natkarni says that there's, you know, Dasava, the nostalgia about the other. I loved your story, uh, like many others, about uh, the Kabutar Khana. Um, you know, I think it, to me, it added, I've seen so many Kabutar Khanas, but this added such a humane uh, sort of touch to how that uh, particular Kabutar Khana. Um, um, uh, sort of uh, has been uh, represented. Uh, it was, uh, and as many other people have said that, uh, the, you know, without a single picture, you've explained this picture, uh, you know, in our heads, you've created this uh, very, very memorable uh, imagery in our head. Uh, Dr. Prabha Sawan says, may your tribe increase. And I think we all uh, join in saying that. 
uh, your words are magical. I, I see so many compliments for you in in the in the conversations here. Um, thank you so much for sharing the Dadar love. Gaurav has asked if there are underrated places to eat in Dadar. Would you have anything for Gaurav in that? I don't eat out. I don't eat out. <laughs> my my home is very underrated for Your its cooking. My home is very underrated. We will all treat that as an invite uh, and uh, join you. Uh, Mosi Namkatam says that this is whetted our appetite for uh, more and would like to have a talk on the other East as well. Uh, Rashmi says thank you for a memorable lecture. Um, um, uh, Mira says that uh, nostalgia is this is nostalgia as, at its best, as does uh, uh, Manjunath. And uh, Sarika says she's overwhelmed with all the information you have given about uh, Dadar. And Mira says once a Dadarkar, always a Dadarkar. I love the spirit uh, of pride in Dadar that you have invoked in so many people today. Um, Gaurav says that the story of the Kabutar Khana was awesome. I agree with him. Um, And um, yeah, as Bharat says, um, uh, you know, today, of course, uh, we'd also like to pay, uh, as Team Khaki, we'd like to uh, pay our homage to uh, Team Patel, who passed away, a poet, player, physician, you know, playwright, painter, and a physician. Uh, uh, so that's, we'll take a moment to offer our uh, homage to him. Um, Atman Mishra says that uh, your book and your observation of Shivaji Park has inspired, had inspired me to do my MA thesis on Dadar, uh, when of course your work was a major support. And uh, a question that always came to his head was, how have the emotions of Dadar residents evolved over time? And what role do these play in preserving the neighborhood's local history and cultural identity? And is there something like emotional heritage that can be uh, worked on? Would you like to say something? Not off the bat, but uh, yeah. See, uh, after the economy was liberalized, the values were just turned upside down in the sense that money came to mean everything. And when um, Shivaji Park precinct was declared a heritage, um, there was a lot of anger among the residents and you couldn't really say to them, look, <laughs> this is heritage. This is the first planned neighborhood in the city. Just look at the buildings. They're so beautiful. But that doesn't count. People finally want money. And if a developer comes along and says, I will build 20 stories here and you will get X sum, which the middle class has never dreamt of. They're going to jump for it. So at one time, there were the kind of values that created Amar Hind Mandar and the Sarvajani Pachana there. But uh, now, uh, that those values have changed. People are reading the younger generation who lives in Shivaji Park. In fact, one person came up to me and said, I think I've seen you somewhere. So I said, really, where do you think? So she said, uh, I, I can't place you, but are you a social worker? Um, do you, does your picture come in the newspapers. So I said, no. I mean, it does come, but it's very tiny, and it comes at the top of the column, which I write. Oh, she said, I don't read that. I said, you don't read what? She said, uh, I don't read newspapers. So I said, uh, how do you get your news? She said, my husband reads them. So her husband reads newspapers and she gets the news via her husband. 
and there are many, many more people since this conversation happened who are not really. So, but I must say that I am speaking of the middle class, the kind of elite middle class. There are still people, uh, peons in fact, uh, builders, assistants, people like that, who are starved for books. It is people like that who still go to the Vachanave. That is why it's thriving. But the early people and their um, descendants have moved on, moved on from reading. So there you are. <laughs> That's a bit. And there's hope in the fact that there are others here who are reading and who are associating deeply with uh, both what we are saying, what you write. Uh, for instance, Shamika says that uh, she's born and brought up in Shivaji Park, uh, been to all the places that you mentioned. She says her mom is a part of the Suryavanshi community and her granny used to work in Kohinoor Mills. So hopefully, uh, you know, the traditions and the emotions or the emotional heritage of Dadar will continue through uh, Shamika and people like her. Uh, some of the restaurants Girish has referred uh, very helpfully are Prakash, Aswad, uh, Misawa, Mama Kane, and more. Uh, so for all those who wanted uh, that information. Uh, Bharat has a question for you. Uh, in which decade did the mantle of progressive thought uh, in Mumbai pass from Girgaon it, it uh, happened precisely around the time that uh, uh, the Shivaji Park precinct was, uh, the, like, reform was already in the air. In fact, I was thinking that the school to which uh, Kashna Guru sent his daughter-in-law could easily have been a school in Girgaon run by a, a lady called Shevanti Bai Nikambe. It was run specifically for young wives and high caste Hindu widows. So, I mean, uh, women's education was actually what led the reformist movement. And it has already taken off in the early 20th century. Uh, and uh, given a space like Shivaji Park, uh, uh, it was enabled further because uh, being a new neighborhood, they could quickly get plots, put up things, start things, and uh, yeah, so so reform was very much in the air. Uh, Dr. Ed Krekha Matkande has a nice comment. She says that, uh, uh, Shanda ma'am, in the true spirit of Dadar, you've laid out a stairway of togetherness for, um, I guess, between the past and the present and the future. So uh, thank you very much for that. Um, if there are no more questions, I'm going to uh, say thank you to all of you. But before that, I'm going to put in a link uh, here in our um, chat right here, asking you all for uh, feedback for um, not just today, but for all our talks and asking you for your views and opinions on um what you would like to hear and see, what you like in our in our in our uh, Kaki Lab talks, and what you would like to see in the future, uh, the link is right here. Uh, but wait, wait, there are more questions. Uh, uh, in the era of digital communication and globalization, how does Dadar's strong emphasis on person-to-person -person relations contribute to the resilience of the emotional history and community spirit? Where is that person-to-person -person communication? Because uh, in my own gully, um, there have been about 
five generations altogether. And uh, one has known all of them, grandfather down. But there's a seven-story building which has come up across the road. It has taken the place of three earlier buildings, two stories. One was just a very, very sweet little ground floor bungalow. And uh, I don't know, I live across from that building. I don't know who is there. I heard, um, I, I kind of hear uh, many children's voices singing happy birthday. So there must be lots of children there. I hear late night horns tooting for the gate to be opened by security. So there are people who are keeping me late nights. Those are the kinds of things I know. I don't know names, I don't know faces. So this one lone building in our lane tells me how mm, towers affect the, the, the interpersonal relationships that we could otherwise develop and did develop. So, so it's what, already fading that, away. That no. personal communication is already fading away and changing the texture and the fabric. But, but let me add, I go for a morning walk in Shivaji Park and there is still such a strong feeling of community. People you don't know will greet you. There's one woman who always, who I think is maybe uh, as old as I am, but she says, I Zapunza. And I feel so good. Somebody cares, somebody shows genuine concern. So um, uh, one old man, never seen him in my life, except in the park. He comes and stands in front of me and very challengingly says, how much? 75? And I say, no, 83. Me, I'm 80. And he walks off. So those interpersonal <laughs> exchanges still happen in Shivaji Park, but not building to building. That's lovely. <laughs> Thank you. We put a link to your book because we had a request uh, about that. So the link to her book is in the chat. A uh, form is also in our chat in which we are seeking your feedback. And we are just absolutely delighted that we could have, we could all be together on this 200th talk. And thank you, thank you, thank you uh, for speaking on this, uh, for gracing this talk. Uh, thank you, thank you, thank you to all the attendees for uh, being with us uh, and enjoy your Saturday evening and enjoy your weekend. Thank you.